Hi, my name is Ilana Horn. Um, I teach at Vanderbilt University, and I recently did this presentation on mathematics teachers learning together at the Northwest Mathematics Conference. Um, I've had a few requests from folks to share the presentation, so I am making a little movie of it so that you can hear what I have to say. Um, please feel free to tweet me or put questions on my blog and we can get a conversation started about this work. Um, so the question is, why have professional learning communities, or PLCs, become so popular? Um, there's a number of studies uh, in sociological ed educational research um, that I've cited below that have looked to find places where student learning outcomes or student achievement is not strongly predicted by demographic variables. So it's sort of higher than expected or more equitable achievement. And one of the things that those schools or departments have in common is that teachers are found to take collective responsibility for student learning. So that's a pretty compelling finding um, that teachers working together can have that kind of impact on student achievement. And given the concerns we have about that, it's something that needs to be pursued. So the sociolo sociologists of education who I mentioned in that earlier slide have posited that what's going on is that teachers are learning by having these kinds of conversations together and by working together. And that that's sort of the secret sauce of why there's these higher than expected student achievements. So. But the problem is that just because research says that you have higher than expected student achievements when stu teachers are collaborating, doesn't mean that the policy logic is gonna fall out the same way, that having teachers collaborate is gonna necessarily improve student outcomes in the way it does in the places where we have found those improved outcomes to be, if that makes sense. It's sort of like the same problem um, with, say, collaborative group work uh, in classrooms. Some teachers find it to be really effective and then another group of teachers might push tables together and say we're not getting the same kind of magic. So there's obviously something more going on in the activity that is supporting teachers professional learning in the places where we have this better than average, uh, better than expected student achievement. So that's sort of where my research takes off. Um, the two students, the two studies I'm going to report from um, one, the first one was a more interventionist study where we were doing professional development with teachers to help them improve um, instruction and student achievement. And um, the second one is more of an observational study um, where we are in two districts in the southeastern U.S. that are trying to improve uh, middle school math. And in both cases, um, the primary data that we're looking at are the teachers collaborating? So again, first study is interventionist, second one observational, both focused on the work of teacher collaboration toward and its contribution towards instructional improvement. Um, there's a lot of commonalities in terms of the data that I'm working off of, a lot of videotapes of teachers' conversations being analyzed. Um, the, probably the biggest difference is that third bullet uh, that the second study has shown to have a lot of turnover, and I'll talk about that more later. Um, but altogether, this analysis comes from over 40 hours of videotape um, of teachers talking. So. Um, if this was a research presentation, right about now is where I would give you my methods. Um, but because I'm really aiming this talk more towards teacher leaders or coaches, um, that you can kind of think that what I have in mind is I'm trying to capture, if I was a new teacher or you were a new teacher sitting in on this conversation, what could you learn about mathematics instruction by listening to these people talk? Um, how how could how is mathematics teaching being made sense of, and what kinds of facets of it are are being made available to think about and problem solve about? Um, 
So before I get into some of the details here, I'll tell you that there are four basic observations that I'm going to share about math professional learning communities. There are four primary activities. The first one is planning. And in some places, uh, teacher collaboration is even called common planning time. The second most common activity is looking at student performance data from achievement tests, especially now that we're in the NCLB era. Um, the third most common and less common than it used to be is looking at student work. And the fourth activity that happens quite a bit is eating. And I think it's just because teachers really don't have enough time in the day to take care of themselves and often spend their lunches tutoring and working with students. Um, the thing, though, that I really do need to point out is uh, in both studies, really rich learning conversations were rare. Um, what this says is that they're not generally what happens in schools and that teachers need support in developing the, them, the tools for having them. So um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, so let's see. Let's see here. Let me get to the next slide. Um, so again, we're trying to figure out what is it that happens when teachers talk together that might contribute to their professional learning in ways that would increase student achievement or what puts the L in PLC. And what my research team and I have found is that the conversations that really highlight the three vertices of what is often referred to as the instructional triangle pictured here um, sh highlight the most um, interesting uh, or richest in, th in representing uh, the work of mathematics instruction and therefore provide the most opportunities for teachers to learn. Um, and I'll explain that more in, in the examples in the rest of the talk. But if, they're if teachers are just talking about teaching, just talking about mathematics, or just talking about students, uh, the opportunities to think about what they're doing instructionally are not going to be as rich as if they're as when they're talking about all three. Um, so for example, you can imagine the question, what are we gonna teach? And what does that really press on? What kind of conversation can follow from that? Um, well, typically what happens is teachers are just talking about the relationship between the teaching and the mathematics, but there's really not always a consideration of students when that is the introductory question. In contrast, you can imagine a teacher leading off by saying, kids are getting confused about complementary angles. How can we help them get it better? That question already highlights and kind of presses on a consideration of not just what the teachers are doing, but particular mathematical content and students' understanding of that content. And, and the conversation that would follow if it took up that question would really need to touch on all three um, vertices of that triangle. So what am I going to do for the rest of this talk? I will show you strong and weak examples of planning since that's the most common activity. Um, strong and weak examples of looking at student performance data since that's the second most common activity. And after each pair of examples, I'll point to possibilities for facilitation that might deepen the learning opportunities for teachers in the conversations. Um, like I said in the talk, I took questions, which is what the slide says, but I can you can tweet them at me or post them on my blog here if you want your questions answered. Um, the point here, though, is that learning can't be taken for granted, um, and it none of these activities is inherently rich with learning opportunities. So in the strong planning example, this this is the one example where I won't get into the details of teacher's talk because it was sort of the sequence of activities that they did over a 45 minute meeting that made it rich with learning opportunities. They started out doing the mathematics together from a lesson that they were planning on teaching. It was sort of a core lesson from the week's instruction. They had a discussion about what of that mathematics was going to be difficult for the students. And then they looked at each other's approaches to the problem and talked about them and thought about how each of these different approaches um, might highlight or address some of the potential com 
uh, confusion students might have. Um, and then they thought about giving their students which approach they might emphasize or how they might try to bring out multiple approaches and connect them. So they really then got into a more nitty gritty discussion of the teaching. So in the course of this conversation, the teachers really thought about all three vertices of the instructional triangle and actually spent quite a bit of time thinking about the the relationships among them. They, they talked about the mathematics to start with. They talked about students thinking. Then they talked about teaching. And they thought about what they would do to try to bring the students in mathematics together, which is that sort of central brown arrow there. Um, the weak planning example uh, is much more typical. It's more of a pacing conversation with Bill saying, we've got to do investigation one. Do you have any idea what you want to do? I thought four, two and four, three would be good to do. I'm more concerned about Wednesday because this whole unit on linear equations is just too long, but I like 4.1. It, it looks pretty good because, you know, we haven't talked enough about y equals mx plus b. We're not really sure what that means, a little commentary there, but that's Bill's take on it. We still aren't really hearing about what the students are doing. True, but that will take me two or three days to get through, and we only have Tuesday or Wednesday to talk about it. Okay, so should we do 4.1 on Tuesday? And then if we have time, we can get into slope more on Wednesday. Um, so in, in that conversation, again, a very typical pacing type conversation, we know a little bit about the mathematics. We know they're doing something with y equals mx plus b and that slope is a concept for the week. Um, the teachers are talking about their pacing and what they're going to have time and not have time to do, but there's really no evidence of what the students are thinking. Um, and it's it's pretty much obscured from, from this conversation. Um, so there's not the opportunities for teachers to learn and rethink instruction are not as strong in this conversation since we just know their preferences about how much time to spend on each part of the the chapter and and not so much thinking about students thinking about the mathematics if that makes sense um okay so thinking about facilitation um, if you are a teacher leader or a coach and you want to kind of press that group from example two to think more carefully about their think their teaching, um, you can ask some of the following questions. You could say things like, well, what, what are the big mathematical ideas that we want to develop in the lesson? And what are some of the different ways students might approach these ideas? Kind of like what the teachers in example one were doing. And then really press on teachers to think about what different approaches, how, how they connect to different understandings. Um, after considering those things, you can think about how you want to open the lesson. W what kind of puzzle do you want to give the students to think about to, to help engage them with the uh, key ideas? And then what would you want to look for as you circulated during the lesson? What would you be listening or looking for on students' paper? Um, and then finally, what would you want them to leave with? And, and how would you know um, that where they're at by the end of the lesson. A lot of these ideas um, are similar to what Sm Smith, Bill, and Hughes have written in the Thinking Through a Lesson Protocol. Um, so it's not entirely new. They, they wrote a paper um, in, I think it's Mathematics Teaching in the Middle School, that is a really useful resource if you're trying to help add depth to teachers' planning conversations. Um, one of the things you have to get them over it is the idea that pacing is really the purpose of the meeting. Um, it's more important to hone in on one key lesson um, for the week and plan it carefully um, than it is, I mean, obviously the pacing conversation may need to happen, but it shouldn't be the emphasis. Moving on to data use, example three. Um, the teacher says, okay, these teachers, by the way, have a lot of things in front of them. They have the test booklet, they have a spreadsheet with test items with the distribution of student responses to different test items. One of the teachers took the test before they met together. Another teacher had a conversation with her class about frequently missed items to get the student's perspective on what was going on. And then with all those resources, they start their conversation. Our kids are having a hard time with it, this because it asks for supplementary angles, but the angles aren't next to one, 
one another. They aren't used to that. Yeah, that's how I showed them too. Exactly. They were looking for the straight line. So they're having a little chat about why this test item was frequently missed. And they've already identified that the, t the students were looking for a particular arrangement on the paper. Um, so they go on to say, well, if they need the straight line, then I don't think they really get supplementary. And the other teacher says, how should we teach it differently next time? And the first teacher says, I don't think we gave them enough of that kind. Yeah, and stressing that the definition is about adding up to 180 degrees. Yeah, the definition. So we need a better variety of problems and more focus on the definition. Um, Again, these teachers are really thinking hard about the frequently missed items and looking at the nature of the problem and what students did with it and using that as a way of thinking back on their instruction. What did they do instructionally that may have led to this misunderstanding, this misconception on the part of students? Then they're projecting into the future and thinking about how might they teach it differently to address the misunderstanding. And, and they recognize that they need to give a a variety of problems and, and that they need to really emphasize the definition because the students were kind of just taking the cue of two student two li uh, angles that were collinear and assuming that that was all that supplementary meant um, and hadn't really developed a robust understanding of supplementary, um, not enough to be able to answer the question on the test. So this was a, a pretty smart use of data to really think hard about the three vertices of the triangle um, weak data use. Now, what happened before this meeting is the principal had the school's data manager put together lists for each teacher um, of all their students and of um, their test score on the prior year's state test. And then this district gives us uh, Inter, inter like tests at six week intervals, kind of like little mini summative assessments. So this is January, so they had uh, about three or four uh, of those test scores. And, and the principal asked the teachers to predict which of their students would be commended, passing, bubble, or growth on the state test. And the teacher spent about 20 minutes looking at the spreadsheets and then using what they knew and observed of the kids in the classroom, trying to make some kind of prediction about, about which kid would be where by um, the time state testing. And the principal had an interest in doing this because uh, he wanted to think about supplementary instruction, additional instruction, and remediation strategies. Um, so the kind of talk that came out of this is teachers saying things like, okay, looking at commended, I have 0%. Passing, I believe I only have about 20%. Bubble kids that need that extra help, that's 50%. And 30% on growth. Of those, that 30%, a fifth failed it last year. The next teacher talks and he says, I have about 33% commended, 17% should pass, 30% that are borderline with a little help could probably be passing, and then one or two students not. So the point here is that there's not a lot of very rich talk going on about instruction. Um, we don't really hear much about we don't hear anything about the mathematics. We don't hear much about the teachers and what kind of information they use to make sense of the students. The students are getting labeled, um, but we really don't know anything about their mathematical thinking. Um, so in terms of what teachers can learn about mathematics instruction in this conversation, uh, we would say that, that it's pretty weak, um, the, the opportunities for thinking about instruction, especially if you compare it to the previous conversation, which actually was using, it was in the same district and was based on um, the same test, although it was one test and not a group of tests. Um, but we argue that the first conversation in example three gave teachers a lot more of an opportunity to think about their instruction, whereas this one doesn't.
um, and that was how the time was spent. So when we think about how you as an instructional leader might press teachers to learn with data, one of the things that the teachers in example three did was that they looked across a kind of a rich variety of information. The student test performance was one thing, and even, even then they had really um, multiple representations of it. They had the distribution of test scores that was disaggregated by question, they had the test booklet, they had their classes data, and, and they had the conversations with the kids. Um, but then questions were asked like, what did we learn about students' understanding of a particular topic? So there you get into the mathematics. What trends do we notice? And then I think this is key in terms of learning about instruction. They were thinking back on prior instruction. Why did the kids make this mistake on such a wide scale? And then they anticipated what they might do differently in their future instruction. So... Um, Taking together, if we're if we're really wanting to, PLCs to be a learning opportunity for teachers, um, there's a few things worth noting. One is that relationships matter. If if we're gonna be talking about our instruction, if we're gonna be talking about what we don't totally understand mathematically, there there needs to be a basis of trust. Um, so that's something a teacher leader or facilitator can try to work on is is really building that trust with teachers. Um, the second thing is that stability matters. Um, in the second study that uh, I mentioned, we have seen tremendous turnover um, because of reconstitution, new administrators, new assignments, all kinds of reasons why it's there's not been a lot of continuity within these groups. And if you can imagine, because this is a not typical form of teacher talk, not a typical way to go about conducting um, professional conversations. There's a lot to learn and, and that trust sometimes takes time. So having stability as a basis for the teachers to work from really does matter. Um, looking at protocols, which is a common way of trying to deepen conversations, I'm guessing um, the research is not totally resolved on this, that they might help, but my guess is they're probably not sufficient. If I think that our goal as a learning community is to coordinate the pacing of our instruction, I may not be inclined to really go deeply into one lesson like happened in example one. So I, I'm not, I don't have a ton of faith that protocols themselves um, can necessarily press teachers in this direction. I have a little more faith in skilled facilitators, um, but I don't think that that's easy work either. I don't think it's enough to just be, for example, a really good teacher, um, and therefore you're able to facilitate this kind of conversation with other teachers. Again, thinking hard about how to steer the conversation, how do you overcome that the teachers feel like they really knew, do need to get this pacing conversation out of the way, and convince them that it's worthwhile to spend time on one lesson thinking about it carefully. Um, how do you push back on administrators who are very concerned about making their AYP? So um, uh, unfortunately, there's a lot about the organization of school that presses for the weaker forms of, of PLC activity. But I don't think that we're going to see those kind of uh, student achievement gains, the student learning gains, um, if we just kind of continue to conduct our conversations about teaching as usual um, in order to get that rich instructional talk, we, we need to kind of slow things down and, and think harder about these um, critical relationships among teaching students in mathematics. So that is my talk. Thank you. And I thank my funders and I thank my research assistants. And I welcome, as I said, your questions.